Cantor's diagonalization argument. This is gonna be a run and gun, hot off the presses take. I'm just kind of excited, so I decided to flip on the camera and get this out there. In, in axiomatic set theory, they have this thing called the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem. And it is a pain in the ass to prove. I mean, you know, a lot of harder proofs out there. It's just a bit annoying. A minor inconvenience, but it took me about a day to kind of let it soak and, and understand it. But basically, what it says is if you have a surjective function from a set A to a set B, and you have another surjective function from a set B to a set A, then there exists a bijective function between those two sets. Okay, just a quick recap here. What an injective function is, is where we have a unique element in the range for every part of the domain. So for each element in the domain here, see these, this guy associates with this guy, this guy over this guy, and this guy associates with this guy. So each element in the domain gets assigned its own special snowflake element in the range. And also we can have these things over here that uh, don't get mapped to. So there's elements in the codomain that can not get mapped to. It is injective if it satisfies the requirements for injectivity if it has unique special snowflake elements for each element in the domain. And a function is not injective, it's not injective, if we have some sorcery like this going on where we have two elements in the domain mapping to the same culprit two-timing range element over here. See how we have this? This is no bueno. So that is not injective. And to cap off our recap, a function is bijective if every element in the domain gets a unique special snowflake element in the range and every element in the range gets hit. So there's no stragglers, there's no little standouts like this that don't get mapped to. There's none of those, These, those aren't allowed. Every element in the range gets mapped to by a element in the domain and every element in the domain gets special snowflake element in the range, okay. Now we're caught up to speed. Let's get into Schroeder-Bernstein. The Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, an absolute classic. So what Schroeder and what Bernstein were, were thinking about at the time, what they were pondering at the turn of 20th century was infinite stuff. And that's honestly just about all I know at the time. Honestly, that's just about as much as I know about the history of this theorem. It was sets and it was infinity. So now you're up to date. And sets and infinity, they wanted to make a theorem and they did and went like this. So if A and B are sets and there exists an injective function from A to B as well as there existing a injective function from B to A. Go around his head there. So see we have a function from A to B here that's injective and we have a function from B to A here that's injective. They said if we have both of these things, then, then there's a bijective function that exists from A to B or B to A. So what that means is if you have A and B over here, that means you can draw, you can make a bijective function that hits every element in the range and gives each one a unique element in the range as well. It's a bijective function. Now it gets trippy when we start talking about infinity because we are no longer in the realm of finite because this is very clearly the case in this, this, this whole this whole thing here because of course we have four elements. So if you have an injective function from one to the other and another injective function going the other way, it forces you just by like the number four to have a bijective function exist because both functions actually have to be bijective. So you just pick one of them and away you go. This is not the case with the infinite case though. The infinite case gets a whole heck of a lot weirder. Now it gets a whole heck of a lot weirder when we start talking about the infinite case because now you're just dealing in this random strange realm of uh, infinity. So to prove the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem for any set of finite or infinite length, you build a janky weird bijection from the two injective functions. So you take the two injective functions and you kind of schmoop them together and make this injective function. And you get this weird sort of bastard child of the two bijection. It is a bijection, it's just kind of bad. All this is to say, it's kind of boring. Boring! It's kind of a boring proof, frankly. I mean, it's an intuitive case for the finite case, so it's not like you're discovering anything new. It's just kind of going, dotting the I's and crossing T's. Anyway, then we get into Cantor's diagonalization argument. And he, this is also for uh, infinite sets. And the continuum hypothesis, which is the crux of this video, has finally started to make sense for me. And I'm excited about it. Because for a long time, it just seemed like this arbitrary abstract bullshit. 
but frankly, today, I'm like, oh, any set, and you take the power set of that set, there is like a natural numbering system that comes about because this set is like bigger than this set, even if this set's infinite and this set's infinite, you know, the set and its power set are both infinite sets. This set is bigger because you can't draw a bijection between the two sets. There's no bijective function that exists. You can prove that no bijective function exists. Then there's a natural equivalence classes that form out of these infinities because if you can draw a bijection between two sets, they're in the same equivalence class of size. Man, I'm, I am not doing this topic well. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid when I was learning this stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to go all abstract, talk like a, like a nut job and be like, oh my god, infinite sets, Cantor's diagonalization argument. Because I remember when I first learned it, I didn't like it. It would suck. But now I'm talking just like the people who were talking to me at the time. Look at my excitement and push on through. This did take me a while to get to this point, though. Equivalence classes get formed out of these infinite sets by the virtue of can you draw a bijection between the two sets, then they're the same size-wise. And so you have this infinite, also, cardinals, where you have, like, the size of infinite sets. Because you can have, like, the natural numbers and then the real numbers, and the real numbers are bigger than the natural numbers. Even though they're both infinite, the real number infinity is bigger than the natural number infinity. And you just all the way up. The power set of the real numbers is going to be bigger than the real numbers. And Cantor's continuum hypothesis says that there is no middle ground set between a set and its power set. There is no halfway. Either if you have a bag of infinity, either it's less than n, n, in the same, you know, less than less than the size of n, like, or equivalent to it. That means you can draw a line between it. It's in n, or bijection with n. It's in the power set of n, or it's bigger than the power set of n. But there's no middle ground. You can't have a set that is bigger than n and smaller than power set of n. Because bigger and smaller in this case doesn't mean, like, the literal amounts because it's infinite. It's this different kind of numbering system. What this video has taught me is I gotta come up with a better way to explain this so I don't sound like a crackhead. Because this is... Yeah, I'm gonna get back to you on that, but I don't know. Get motivated, axiomatic set theory becomes kind of fun. Oh, really? My past self is cringing at me saying this, but axiomatic set theory is kind of based. That is all for this one, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to the cabin. A lot of math coming up, a lot of stuff going on. I'm currently reading uh, Tour Through Mathematical Logic by a guy named, I don't know his first name, but his last name is Wolf. Really good book. I'm gonna give you some updates on that in the future, but without further ado, take it easy. I love you, Godspeed, and I'll see you in the next one, which is gonna be in the next several days. Peace.